Hello and welcome back for episode 35 of the Newbie Dentist Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Omid Azami. It is 2019 and I'm proud to be, you know, releasing the first episode of the year. Uh, it's been a few weeks off. I've been away, you know, enjoying the holidays and uh, quite busy with work uh, leading up to the holidays. Everyone's trying to sort of use up their insurance. So it is quite a busy period. Uh, in this episode, I have a fantastic guest, someone who I admire and look up to greatly and have been hoping to speak to for a long time. He's also a fellow podcaster based in Australia, uh, Dr. Jesse Green. Dr. Jesse Green is a dentist, entrepreneur, coach, and thought leader um, who has founded the Practice Max program, which offers the latest entrepreneurial thinking tools and cutting edge ideas for the dental and non-dental worlds. Uh, Jesse also hosts the Savvy Dentist podcast, which I'm a regular listener to and a big fan of. And he's also an author. He's wrote the Amazon number one bestseller, Retention, How to Plug the Number One Profit Leak in Your Dental Practice. So uh, understandably, this week's episode is quite special. I certainly learned a lot from this episode from uh, Dr. Jesse Green. A lot of nuggets of information that only come from years and years of experience and expertise, uh, which I hope uh, to pass on to you guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed as much as I did. Um, for me, it's been a great, uh, you know, 2018, uh, moved on to Australia and, you know, started the newbie dentist study club and we ran our first event and we're hoping to continue that on in 2019 with some great events and hopefully some hand on hands on components as well. For the podcast, I'm hoping to get a little bit more regular. I've been uh, slacking a little bit, but I have some big plans to kind of uh, break down the episodes a little bit more into different themes. And I want to really, you know, do a clinical side of things where we uh, do some, you know, deep dives into some clinical aspects of dentistry and also um, change it up a little bit and talk to some, you know, high achieving dentists and talk about their journeys um, and some self-improvement sort of uh, entrepreneurial side of things as well. So keep an eye out for that. I will be announcing these things as they come along and I'm kind of working away and, you know, um, contacting the the dentist that I want to interview so those will be arranged and they should be coming out in the you know the next few months so without further ado I hope you guys enjoy this episode with Dr. Jesse Green and please reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook if you have any feedback I do love to hear from you guys thank you Welcome to the Newbie Dentist Podcast, the safe place for newbie dentists to connect, collaborate, learn, and grow. The Newbie Dentist Podcast aims to provide high quality and high value content for all the newbie dentists out there. With your host, Dr. Omid Azami. So Jesse, thank you so much for uh, giving me some of your time. I know you're a tremendously busy person and I really appreciate you coming on and you know sharing your experience and your advice with all our uh, newbie listeners out here. So if you don't mind, uh, normally how I'd like to start th- these things off is just uh, kind of jump into a bit of an origin story. So if you can kind of just take me back to like your, uh, your dental school days, what your, your vision was, what your hopes were, what your uh, long-term plans were, and then how it's kind of evolved to where you are today, that would be amazing. Yeah, cool. Look, firstly, thank you so much for having me on your show. It's great to meet a fellow podcaster and um, I hope we can get through some great stuff and and add some value to your audience. Um, My journey, I have to tell you, has been anything but linear. And so when I went to dental school, I went to the University of Queensland in Brisbane and from a young age, I'd always wanted to be a dentist. So going to dental school, I remember walking in there and back in the day, you could still we still use eugenol based products. So I remember <laughs> smelling the eugenol and feeling like I'd arrived. It was yeah. really <laughs> weird. Um, but I, look, I had a, a good experience at dental school. It was fine. I, I was a relatively conscientious student, um, you know, and I did okay. I mean, certainly wasn't the star of the show by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. You know, there were plenty of um, smarter, more talented people than me that went through, but, Prior to joining dental school, prior to going to dental school, I'd had my first business at high school. Oh, nice. So I guess from a, even before dental school, I'd had this taste of business and I really liked it. And um, I was selling football jerseys at high school. And <laughs> back in the late 80s, that wasn't such a thing as it yeah. is now. And so back then I was you know, designing jerseys, selling jerseys. Um, That's great. Manufactured. And I ultimately understood leverage at a young age because I was getting the other school kids to, to work for me. Um, and that leverage ultimately is what got my business closed down because <laughs> you're not allowed to do that at school. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I went to dental school and I really enjoyed it and I'd forgotten all about that business experience. And 
in the mid 1990s in Australia, we had a recession. And so I was thinking, okay, well, when I finish dental school, what am I going to do? And there was concern in the, the general economy at the time. So I was very fortunate. I was offered a military scholarship. So oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, I was really lucky. So for the, the final three years of my degree, I was a Navy undergraduate. And then when I um, finished university, I went to you know the Navy proper and I, I spent some time down at HMA Service, um, down in yeah. Victoria near you. Uh, and then uh, some you know, time in Sydney and on ships and a short, I mean, various shore bases as well and over in the UK. So um, it, it's been a good journey. I've been very fortunate. Dentistry has given me a wonderful life. So I'm tremendously grateful. That's great. And how long was the amount of time they had to spend in the Navy after you finished up dental school? Yeah. So the, the standard thing is the number of years that they sponsor you for plus one. So okay. they say pay the last three years of my degree. So four years. But look, I was having such fun. I stayed longer. <laughs> so I was pretty happy. I was, you know, working out at Watson's Bay in Sydney, which anyone listening will know that it's a beautiful part of Sydney, harbour views, ocean yeah. views. Nice. Yeah, like, and I finished work at three thirty. No, it's good lifestyle. It was fantastic. Yeah. Job ever, and uh, so I was really happy doing that. And then um, I stayed on for about seven years after graduation, I think it was. And then, you know, as happens sometimes, I met a girl, and um, and that's where it got complicated. <laughs> That's great. So, so after the seven years finished up, um, did you start just working in private practice as an associate or were you kind of ready to set up shop and to open your own practice at that point? So after seven years, uh, during my time in the Navy, I became reacquainted with some business things and I uh, got involved in various, um, I suppose, uh, unsuccessful commercial ventures in a sense as involved with network marketing and other things like that. But I was interested in learning the skills that they offered. So yeah. I remember hearing Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad, poor dad, or yeah. but it's a good skill to be able to sell. So I joined network marketing while I was in the Navy to develop some of those business skills. Then when I left the Navy, my wife's a dentist and um, I came to Canberra to, to be with her and I didn't go into our practice at that point. I went in and as an associate and yeah, you know, I had a lot to learn around the commerce of dentistry in particular. I'd done yeah. that a fair bit clinically while I was in the Navy. I was fortunate to have some terrific mentors uh, from a clinical perspective. But when I got into private practice, it was a whole new ball game. And you know, I had patients who you know, wanted to pay for things, which I'd never experienced before. Well, they yeah. probably didn't want to pay for things, but they, <laughs> they needed to pay for things. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to get better at asking for money. I had to get better at trying to put value on my uh, abilities and my skills, value on my time. And that was a process that didn't happen overnight. It just certainly was something I had to grow into. Yeah. I think that's a great point that you made because uh, obviously, you know, having studied in uh, Australia, the dental school, it provides free dental care for patients that come in because of the public system. So I think that was a big shock for most of the Australian grads when they finish up school because they're not really used to talking money with patients or having to kind of deal with that. Uh, whereas I know like in the US and uh, in Canada to a certain extent, uh, obviously it's reduced fees, but there's still that monetary aspect there that they kind of get training in during dental school. Uh, so I think it's a little bit of a more of a seamless kind of uh, transition into private practice for them once they uh, finish up school. So you're, you're working as an associate in these practices. You're kind of, you know, developing these skills. What was the, at this point in your kind of life, did you have like some long-term vision of where you wanted to end up or you were just kind of taking it day by day and kind of seeing where things went? So, yeah, look, it, there was a vision, but the vision changed. And I think the vision really was for us to build our own dental practice. Uh, as I said, my wife's a dentist. So she already had a practice at that point in time. And so once we got married and started a family, um, it was a natural thing for me to step into that practice while um, she was, you know, doing kids and things like that, um, being, being mum. And, and that was a choice that we were very fortunate to be able to make. Um, yeah. so I realise not everyone has that luxury. Uh, so when I started in that practice, it was quite run down. It had a fantastic patient base, but the physical premises were run down. Yeah. Uh, all the patients adored my wife. Uh, she's extremely good at building a following. And I walked in and all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm not her. And, so, and not only did the patients notice the change, the, the staff and the team noticed the change. There was a guy that came in who they didn't know, who had a military background. And all of a sudden, you know, things changed. 
And so, you know, with the retrospectoscope, there's a lot of things I would have done differently, but I just didn't know any better at the time. And, and so the vision was for that practice to be the best boutique style practice that we could build, where it was yeah. renowned for high quality dentistry, renowned for a patient experience. Uh, it was um, a high fee practice and we were able to, you know, really go and, and build that. The, the big problem that I had is at that time, I followed um, traditional practice management paradigms and those paradigms are still out there today. But really, those traditional practice management paradigms um, lead to a situation of self-employment. So it's great if you love clinical dentistry and oh, I enjoy it, but I wanted to create a real business. But what I did is I created a job. And so... After a while, the practice that was, you know, beautiful in every possible way began to feel not so enjoyable yeah. because I was busy, I was tired, I was burning out. And it came to a point where it's like, you know, do I really have to do another crown? Um, which I know sounds horrible and <laughs> like that out loud I can hear yeah. it um, but at the time I was just so tired and stressed out and burned out and it was because I'd followed this you know well-worn path along practice yeah. management learnings and and anyone looking into our practice would have thought it was really great and successful because we we're making a lot of money uh, we had more patients than you know we could poke a stick at but internally I was dying and yeah. so that's when things started to really change. So the initial vision was to build this great practice and then yeah. I didn't love it as much as I thought I'd love it. That's great. I'm excited as you said that because I'm just kind of smiling here because I'd written down, uh, I've been reading uh, Robert Kiyosaki's uh, Cash Flow Quadrants. So you, like you mentioned, you kind of were self-employed in that practice. You're working in that practice um, instead of being the business owner so you can take a step back and kind of have it run without you actually being present to do the clinical dentistry side of things. So there's a couple of kind of follow-up questions to that. Uh, one is, Obviously, for newer dentists, as we're kind of coming up and uh, we got clinical experience to learn, so we're focusing on like CPD and getting better at dentistry. But at the same time, maybe we have that longer vision of maybe one day we want to be business owners as well. How do you find that balance of be focused on getting becoming a really good dentist first and then shifting over to being a more business minded or kind of if you have any advice on that balance of things or how you kind of did it, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So it's... um. It's an interesting journey. And of course, everyone's going to have a different perspective on this, but I kind of liken it to, you know, when on your stereo, you've got your bass and your treble and yeah. dial one up and dial one back. Yeah. So certainly, you know, my, my comment would be that being a great dentist does not guarantee commercial success. However, being a poor dentist does guarantee commercial failure. <laughs> yeah. So there is certainly a place for honing and developing clinical skills. And I think for newer dentists, that's a, an appropriate and important thing to do. Um, now, that said, uh, for those people who are really love clinical work and that's where they see their future, then you know, perhaps developing the business skills and acumen may not be as necessary. They might say, in an employment situation or a contracting situation. For, yeah. and, that, and that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But for those people that do want to own their own practice, then I think that you know, probably a few years out, you want to start thinking about some of those skills that you want to develop. You know, fundamentally, I think one of the most important skills that as humans we can all develop is the ability to communicate effectively. And yeah. that serves you well clinically. It also serves you really well in the business context as well. So I think, Developing clinical skills is, is key and paramount. Uh, developing communication skills is key and paramount. And beyond that, developing the business skills for those people that want to go down that path, um, I think is you know, a really good thing to do. In terms of timeframes, again, everyone's different. Some will come out of university straight away and want to be in business, and that's cool. Yeah. As a rule of thumb, understanding that it's not a one-size-fits-all, I would say give it you know, good three years of just honing your clinical skills, get good at that and then start looking a bit further afield. Perfect. And so how do you sort of balance your time nowadays? Are you still doing some clinical dentistry or are you kind of more so just a business owner now and doing that kind of coaching things that you kind of enjoy doing now? Yeah, I do a little bit of clinical work because I enjoy it. Yeah. Um, parts of it. Yeah. I still don't enjoy <laughs> some things, you know, when you find yeah. yourself doing an endo on a, you know, upper seven <laughs> opening or something like that, um, even though I enjoy endo. But 
primarily my work these days is business ownership. I would do very little dentistry, um, but I, I do enough to keep my hand in um, and I enjoy seeing the people whom I treat. Um, but, you know, by and large, my work these days is operating the business and running my other, you know, consulting coaching business as well, the Savvy Dentist business. And so that's really where my time gets divided these days. And look, I enjoy that. Again, for me, that's where I get my intellectual stimulation um, mm-hmm. and, and that lights me up. So I'm very, very happy with that. Yeah. So how many years after, um, you know, you start to develop these kind of systems within your own practice um, and implementing and maybe stepping back a little bit clinically, um, did you think it's always oh, time to kind of start teaching these methods and um, start running the coaching and all that? How many years after all, um, that? It was a time frame like for that uh, journey. Okay, so again, very. Uh, uh, I suppose it's not a linear process. Again, I'm trying yeah. to work for the opposite of <laughs> for some reason. I'm having a mental blank. <laughs> but it, in any case, it wasn't a linear process. When we had that first practice that I was telling you about, where it was making good money, it looked awesome from the outside, um, but I was dying inside. Is we sold that business and moved to Brisbane, which is home for me. Yeah. And during that time, you know, I thought to myself, I never want to own another practice. I never want to do this. I never want to do that. And so, um, you know, I thought that it would be so much simpler for me to, you know, go and be an associate. Um, turns out that I'm the worst. Associate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but during after look after about six months of not running a business, I started to get bored, and so I started building internet uh, websites, and mm-hmm. so I was selling all sorts of things online, affiliate based products, all sorts of you know weird and wonderful things. And before too long, my university friends would say, "Hey, you know what a crown is? You know what a bridge is? Can you build us a practice website?" So yeah. we build the website and then say, "Oh, can you help us get some traffic to it?" So we're doing these SEO campaigns and early days, PPC, Google AdWords and all the rest of it. And uh, that was going really well. So we built out a digital marketing agency for for dentists and that was great. Um, But what ended up happening is people would say to me uh, in the early days, could you just make the phone ring? And we'd go, okay, sure. (laughs) So we made the phone ring, got all the new inquiries. Yeah. And they'd go, oh, my recall system's not working or (laughs) how do I manage this and how do I manage that? And so... I'd go through my files and I'd start teaching some of those things. But I guess it wasn't, again, a, a hugely planned out, laid out process. It was an evolution and an iteration uh, from one thing to the next. But the key thing to mention, though, is what I learned in that internet marketing space was the concept of scalability and leverage. And I learned how to do that. And I thought, yeah. oh, if only I had done that in my first practice, I could have had a completely different business. Um, but I'd, I'd built the wrong business model. So now I know mm-hmm. what business model to build. So I think it probably took, uh, look, I've been teaching people how to do this now for about five years or so. And like every business, it started off slow. Yeah. Um, we certainly had our setbacks and our hiccups. And, uh, and we still have setbacks and hiccups because that's the journey. Uh, <laughs> but... Yeah, but look, it took me a while to be, I was a slow starter in that. Yeah. No, oh, that's really impressive. I think a couple of the good uh, takeaways from that would be that um, you're very adaptive. It seems like as you kind of provided one service to your you know clients and friends, um, as they realize, oh, I need this service, you were able to adapt and like provide that as well, which is pretty cool. So like you said, you're kind of constantly evolving what you're offering to kind of fulfill the needs. Um, and I think, I mean, it's 2018 now, this might, might be easy for us to be like, oh yeah, Fair enough, you did like a online marketing strategy and things like that. But I think for when you started it, it was probably a pretty cutting edge kind of thing. So yeah. that's also uh, equally impressive. So well, uh, those new things for that. SEO. <laughs> like SEO, everyone's kind of, what's yeah. SEO? Oh, yeah. right. and now, now, of course, everyone knows it and gets a million emails. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know about it. But yeah. yeah, so it was fun. It was really good. And I remember, it's funny because when I started doing that, Again, it was accidental. I was, I'd sold the business and I was walking through an airport and I read a book by a guy called Brett, Brett McFall, which was called Make Money While You Sleep. And as it turns out, it was a pretty crappy book. <laughs> I don't know if I need to edit that out. Uh, but anyway, it wasn't a great book, but it did set me on a journey. And, and you know, I met Brett and, and he gave me some advice around some things, which was helpful. But that's what started that whole journey. It was literally walking through the airport, one book, building a website. Oh, that's an interesting 
you know, I could sell something online and, and off it went. And so, um, you know, there we go. That's great. Yeah. I love those stories. Um, there's, and the reason I bought that, uh, cash flow quadrant. Um, so I listened to uh, Mark Costas podcast as well. And a few weeks ago he had, um, I think it's Buck Joffrey's who's like a MD based in the U S to kind of stop clinical practice. And now he's like, a, you know, real estate owner and kind of investor and things. And he was, he said the same thing. He was going on his honeymoon and he picked up the cash flow quadrants just to read on the plane. And he's like, when I landed, I was like a changed man and it kind of changed like his whole worldview and stuff. So it's cool that he had this sort of a similar experience in the airport. Yeah. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, we'll shift over to kind of the, uh, the bulk of what I was hoping to talk to you about today and kind of, uh, pick out your expertise and, and try and, uh, get some good value for all the listeners. Um, and that obviously comes around like the practice ownership uh, side of things. Um, so my first question you already answered, which was kind of how soon is too soon. So I think, like you said, that kind of three-year range to get some clinical experience under your belt, just so you're competent if, once you open the doors. Now in that same kind of question there, is there certain, um, procedures that you think dentists need to be like fairly competent, like say ortho or implants or any like additional things that maybe we don't learn in dental school that we should be competent at before we open doors? It's a really good question. Um, and I'm going to share a philosophy of mine and this may not resonate with some people. I realize this is going to sound a little counterintuitive to some mm -hmm. people, but any success we've had in any of our businesses has been due to mastering certain fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So my strong suggestion is be competent at the fundamentals. So yeah. how to do a decent examination, how to treatment plan, how to do good class two uh, resins, how to take a tooth out, how to do an endo, all yeah. of those things that you see day in, day out, I think are really important skills because too often things get referred out that could be kept in house. And beyond that, I think once you've mastered that skill set, then I think it's time to start looking at other things, you know, whether it's you know, implants, whether it's ortho, uh, you know, whatever it happens to be. But I guess, you know, the gray hair in me, uh, I, I like to see people who can execute the basics well. Yeah. Because I think that's the bread and butter. I've observed some people, and I know this again is going to sound counterintuitive and uh, for your audience members, don't lynch me. Um, but my experience and my observations are that there's some small group of people that like to get into the really complicated and advanced stuff before they've mastered some of those fundamentals. And my worry around that is when things don't go smoothly. Yeah. So, so you're taking on more liability, more risk. Um, so you got to weigh the pros and cons, I guess, of that, if it's going to be worth that extra little bump in production. Absolutely. So uh, look, just a, a small little side note. I mean, I was traveling to the United States a little while ago, interestingly enough, to see the rich dad in the rich dad, poor dad story, right? Oh, I called oh really? <laughs> well, I <actually> invented the, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, but I, on the plane, I was watching <laughs> a documentary uh, it was about Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe, the two tennis players from the yeah. 70s and 80s. And that's the era that I was playing tennis. And Bjorn Borg was so famous. And the reason he had so much success is because he didn't make unforced errors. Yeah. And so a lot of what we talk about is minimizing unforced errors. I like that. Yeah. And so... Yeah, you know, when it comes to clinical practice, I think you know, if you can execute those fundamental things really, really well, you're going to minimize your unforced errors. You're going to learn some of those foundational skills around occlusion. You're going to learn some of the things that should work and do work. Then you'll have a good understanding when you then step up into implants or ortho of what those foundations are and you're building on them rather yeah. than trying to build a tower on foundations that might not be as solid as they could be. So again, that might be a little counter to other people's perspective, but that's, that's just a view that I have. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think it's, it's important to, like you said, get the foundation right first. So you have uh, those to fall back on. Um, I think a lot of the new grads, I mean, us being millennials, uh, we're pretty hungry just to get to the end pretty quick. So I think that's our struggle. And that's what we got to kind of come to grips with is like slow down a little bit, pump the brakes and get the foundation right. Yeah, but interestingly enough, with the millennials, I was having a conversation with another well-known dentist on my podcast, um, and we were talking about the fact that I think the millennials are going to be better dentists than we Gen Xers ever will be. And the reason I think that is because 
for two two reasons. One is there's this genuine hunger and thirst and drive and ambition, which is fantastic. Yeah. And certainly I don't want to curb that. I think that's absolute wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Um, the other thing that I think is really great for you guys is the accessibility of information. Uh, that's huge. It's huge. So things like online learning now is such a thing, whereas you know, 10 years ago even, it was less of a thing. We built a business 10 years ago called Dental Sumo. It was about online learning and we were just a bit too early. Yeah. Um, whereas now it's, um, it's everywhere. So I think the beauty for you guys as millennials is I think you guys are going to be possibly the most highly skilled group of dentists thus far um, because of the drive, the ambition and the access to knowledge. And I think that's a really good thing. So uh, in my quest to make sure the foundations are in place, I'm still all in favor of being driven. Yeah, no, that's great. I think that's a great point that you made. I mean, just with uh, social media, with um, you know the dental community we have on Instagram, uh, which is sort of where I kind of, uh, my podcast is pretty based in Instagram because most of my guests and things I kind of you know find there and I build those relationships and we bring them on. Uh, but it's become really cool. I mean, if, you have, if you're stuck doing uh, an endo, there's a bunch of endodontists around the world, you can just shoot them a message and they'll get back to you like right away, uh, which is like unbelievable. We have access to so much uh, information and knowledge and wisdom uh, which i think it is unique you guys probably didn't have similar access maybe like 20 years ago so no, we, we certainly didn't it's interesting you're talking about instagram and i'm laughing to myself because my daughter uh said to me because i use facebook as a social media yeah. primarily and my daughter says to me oh facebook's for old people <laughs> and, you know, and, and you know, it probably is um, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting thing because different different demographics different yeah people. Yeah, I think the analogy I like was that once our parents uh, got on Facebook, we, th- we realized it's not cool. So we had to migrate somewhere else. So. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, my mother in law's on Facebook and I can yeah. see her post. So, yeah. <laughs> so, in, um, in that same realm of like practice ownership, for, for the you know, younger dentists out there, what's your general advice when it comes to buying an existing practice versus starting from scratch? Because that's something that, you know, a lot of young grads now, you know, there's definitely pros and cons to both sides of things. Uh, starting from scratch, maybe you can pick your location a little bit better. You can set things up how you like from the start and not have to like reverse engineer things that have been already done. But then on the flip side, you know, buying a practice, you have some income, you have some patience. So it might be a more easy transition. So what's your, been your experience working with, uh, with dentists starting up practices or buying? And what would you recommend for, you know, us millennials looking to buy and enter uh, practice ownership? Again, I think it's going to be a case-by-case scenario because uh, it'll depend on risk appetite. It'll depend on the access to finance. It'll depend on a whole variety of different things. But you're quite right. You've identified the pros and cons very neatly there of each of those options. Um, so I think yeah, in my uh, case, I personally have a strong preference for buying existing practices because of the cash flow. Yeah. Like for me, cash flow is everything. I, when there's money coming through the door, I'm, I'm sleeping much better. Yeah. Um, and so that's my personal risk tolerance and my personal profile. Now, if you spoke to someone else like no cash up, who's really good at startups, uh, and then he's probably got a preference for that. Um, and I don't think either one is better or worse than the other. It depends on the opportunities that are available. So if you're going to go into a startup situation, then clearly the ability to choose a good location is going to be key. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's going to need to be in a location that A, is going to make the business commercially viable, but B, you're going to want to live in as well. Yeah. Yeah, there's no benefit in my mind, at least, to say I'm going to start a, a practice from scratch in the middle of you know, some remote area and it might be the world's best dental practice. But if you hate living there, yeah, it, it's not so cool. So um, I think it's really going to depend. But I, the key thing I would say, no matter whether you buy practice or whether you start from scratch, it's really important to keep your cash flow really under control. The mistake mm-hmm. I see with some startups, not all, but some is, over pimping the practice to start with. So yeah, you know, on day one, we probably don't need a Seric machine. <laughs> yeah. Just not. Uh, and you know, we all love CAD cam and all the digital technology, but it's an expensive piece of kit. Yeah. So for me, I think it's about, if you were to start a practice, it's about staging the in- implementation and integration of those expensive or more expensive pieces of kit. Um, so, you know, 
but minimal viable product would be good to start with so you can get some patients in get some throughput and so on and then build from there yeah but you're right if you buy an existing practice there's some things you might need to undo or, or to change and that comes with certain challenges around the existing team culture perhaps or the existing culture of the patient base and their expectations there is no right or wrong um i think it depends on how people want to go um i know different people say that if you're buying a practice it's great to have a walk-in walk-out relationship with the owner um again i understand the logic of that i get it but I also think if you've got a good relationship with that vendor, the seller, then that seller can really hand over the goodwill for you very nicely. Yeah. So that's big. Yeah, it's massive. So if you are going to buy a practice from an existing um, owner, then I, I would be wanting to be the son or daughter that that practice owner never had and you know, <laughs> be a friend um, and yes. make their transition into retirement simple and easy and straightforward. And in return, they will endorse you and edify you and the patients will stick with you. And that's really what's important. So I, I'd, be, I'd be thinking along those lines. Yeah. So in, in general sense of practice ownership, um, obviously, you know, uh, we're based in Australia now, but uh, all of the listeners are based in the US and in Canada as well. And I think similar things kind of apply broadly to, you know, most big cities that are quite saturated. Um, obviously, there's a rise with like corporate dentistry and those kind of chains coming in, uh, making it a little bit trickier for like the small practice owner to kind of compete on, on overhead and all those kind of uh, things. So um, what I've been sort of thinking about a little bit is if you're going to enter into practice ownership uh, to do so with a good group of people, maybe one or two partners. Um, so that way, especially if you're doing a startup sort of model, um, you know, you can all, all maintain sort of a part-time associateship elsewhere just to keep that cash flow coming in. Um, so you're not all in on the practice from day one and kind of struggling for cash flow. So in terms of, yeah, competing with uh, the corporate model, do you think this group practice uh, might be a way to go kind of uh, going forward into the future? Yeah, I certainly think it's a good way of mitigating risk um, because as you quite rightly point out, you're able to share the cost, you're able to you know, do all those things. Uh, of course, you know, the fundamentals still need to be right, location and the so on. Um, if you're trying to divide a, a meager patient flow across three partners or something, then yeah. that's going to be problematic. But assuming you've done that research and you've got good patient flow, some good marketing and, and so on behind you, then yeah, I think that can really work. And then what happens is slowly you you whittle down your time in your you know, employment situation and you migrate fully into your own business. So I think that can definitely work. Um, yeah, I, I think it's fine. Um, the corporate situation I think is going to accelerate. Yeah. I think that that, well, certainly it's not going to go backwards, but um, I think you know, we're going to see continuing changes in the operating environment. So I guess pairing up with some other um, partners gives you greater resources to tap into, um, if necessary, greater borrowing capacity. Yeah. So there's some advantages in that for sure. So, uh, again, choose your partner as well. It's a bit like a marriage. Yeah. So, you know, I think that that would work really well. That's great. And what's your thoughts on um, like single practice ownership and getting one, you know, practice like really humming and like maybe adding more chairs or expanding that one location out uh, versus like opening kind of multiple locations, which seems to be a kind of a trendy thing for us uh, young dentists to kind of brag about at dinner parties. Um, so what's, what's like that overall business model and philosophy? What do you think about that multi-practice ownership? So I'm going to be, I'm going to be shot down for this. Um, <laughs> I have clients who own multiple practices and they do it really well. I know other people who have multiple practices that do it really well. However, I think most people with multiple practices have one good practice and an ugly stepsister. Someone <laughs> is the other practice, right? Yeah. And so, and that's because focus and attention is divided. So there are a few people who do it very, very well. And so it can be done. I'm not saying it can't be, but I think for most people, the way to get better leverage is to have multiple chairs under one roof. Yeah. Because you are not replicating overhead as much. You have the ability to create a cohesive team culture and you're not trying to be in two places at one time. And I think it's just a simpler operation all around. Um, so I would say for the vast majority of people who want to create leverage and create a true business versus, you know, self-employment, uh, then I think that's a simpler way to go. Now, the challenge of course, though, is, you know, the physical infrastructure. 
you know, how do I build a building that's big enough to have six, eight, 10 chairs, whatever it happens to be. And again, that's a process that takes time. So that's why some people I think are finding it uh, in their mind easier to have maybe two, two chair practices or something like that. Um, And again, it can work. There's no doubt that it can work, but um, my experience would be that from a simplistic point of view, um, all the chairs under one roof is just an easier model. I, look, I interviewed a guy on my podcast, a guy called Harry Margaret, uh, and he owns a large practice in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, okay. And I think, I can't remember how many chairs he's got, but it's a lot. And yeah. we had this exact conversation and he's owned multiple practices and done all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and he, for him, he said, look, it just became a case of simplicity and mm-hmm. being able to give all his attention to that one thing. And so for me, that, that resonates with me. I, again, I realize there'll be others that have a different perspective. In our place, we, we have one practice. I have another business, you know, obviously, around coaching and consulting. Yeah. I can tell you that splitting focus just between those is, is you know, it's, it's a challenge. It's true. And yeah. So, yeah. But look, that's just a personal viewpoint. I, I'm sure you could have other guests on who would say something completely different to that. And that yeah. would be just as correct. So I think no, for the person listening to the show, know yourself. No, yeah, no, that's a big one. Yeah. I think um, like we were talking about before, um, you know, with the, with the dental podcasters and everything like, you know, Mark Costas, Howard Fran, yourself, you know, the, the podcasts are kind of business oriented. I think that's why I like the, uh, like the juxtaposition between Howard Fran and Mark Costas, you know, Howard Fran's had like that one practice since day one that he started up from scratch and that's been his bread and butter. And he's just maximized that one location. Uh, Mark Costas obviously is like system driven, multiple practice ownership, like DSO model. So it's nice to see that both can be successful. I think just like you said, comes down to your personality and your kind of, um, capacity for stress and, yeah. and risk tolerance yeah and all those things i think you know really the key thing to understand is that as you go from being self-employed to a true business owner your role changes so it's a different skill set it's a different mindset and so rather than being the guy or the girl who's focused on providing clinical care the role really shifts to being the guy or the girl who can build great teams to deliver great c- clinical care yeah and so that's a simple thing to say, but it's actually much harder to achieve. So again, if you can do that across multiple locations and you're good at that, then that is awesome. So systems and team are critical. Um, but if you think that it's a simpler exercise to do it under one roof and, and so on, then do it under one roof. But I think it's about knowing yourself, knowing your inherent strengths, your inherent weaknesses, and then finding a business that suits you and your strengths. And again, that'll be different for different people. As you say, yeah. Mark likes, I think he's got 10. I can't remember. Yeah. I, you know, something yeah. like, crazy, right? Yeah. Howard's got one. I've got one. I've got friends that have got two, three, and four. Again, there is no right or wrong. It's just know thyself. Yeah, for sure. Um, and sort of the last question I had with uh, in this kind of space is uh, how to find the ro- location based on the type of dentistry you want to be doing um, and how to kind of like prioritize that. I don't know which comes first. Like, do you find the location first and then see what, what clientele and what demographics you have? Or do you be like, no, I want to do like, like you said, you had in Canberra, like a boutique style high end practice and then try and find pockets in the city that uh, kind of fulfill that niche or uh, have the demographics to support that kind of practice. How would you sort of prioritize, you know, that decision-making uh, process? Yeah. Okay. So that's a really good question. And it's a, uh, it's a really good question and it's a complicated answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of things that I would say around that. The, if you wanted to run a high end boutique practice, typically that's going to be located, but not always, but typically located in a more metropolitan area. Now, I, again, I've got clients that do it regionally and they do very, very well. Um, so you can certainly do it. I think what needs to happen first is where are their patients? You know, where can I, if I put a practice in at you know, this particular location, am I going to, is there enough patients in the surrounding area that I can then attract a decent enough following to make it commercially viable? The second question is what is the um, demographics of the area that I'm locating my practice in? Is it, you know, high end demographics, middle of the road or lower socioeconomic area? Because you, know, you need to have, if you want to run a boutique practice, for instance, you need to have high income earners. And if you're going to be located somewhere where, quite candidly, there's not much money, then that's going to be a challenge for you no matter what sure. you do. Yeah. So I think 
um, for me, first and foremost, is where is there going to be patient flow? Second thing is, what's the demographic of that area? Does it fit the kind of dentistry that I want to do? And take it from there. And look, just to give you an example of this, and I realize this is going to sound ridiculous as I say it out loud, but <laughs> yeah. I was giving a presentation a little while ago on the topic of marketing. And I was talking about understanding the ideal patient profile, the ideal patient avatar. Yep. And from a marketing perspective, that's who you're aiming to attract. Uh, it's not the only person who will come to the practice, of course, but anyway. So there's a guy sitting at the back of the room and you know, his arms folded. And, you know, when you're a presenter, this is not going, <laughs> this is not going well. <laughs> this yeah. is what you want to see in your audience. You know, he's leaning back in his chair with his arm folded and then he puts his hand up and says, Jesse, I think this is all BS. <laughs> oh, okay. Right, that's good to know. <laughs> tell, me, tell me why. And uh, he described his ideal patient uh, profile and it was someone who, you know, was tertiary educated. Uh, they drove a European car. They were interested in cosmetic dentistry. They had a disposable income of multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. You know, you get the picture. And then I said, okay, well, that's, that's all fine. So what's the problem? He goes, well, my practice is located in this area where the demographics are really, it's low socioeconomic area. And I said to him, so in essence, you're asking rich people <laughs> to leave their rich suburb, <laughs> drive past hundreds of other dentists on their way to a lower um, or less affluent suburb and come. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, yeah. I said, well, you know, there's a problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> And so I think, you know, coming to your question, you've got to be able to identify an area that is underserviced uh, for the patients that you want to serve. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that's, um, so do you have a rough, obviously it's like metrics and things might be a bit tricky, but is there a rough patient to uh, like dentist ratio that you think would be an adequate space? So if you're running demographics in a given suburb, for example, what would be something that, would be a red flag to like avoid or something that you can kind of work with, with like adequate marketing and branding and all that. Yeah, so for me, look, a rule of thumb. And again, you've got to not just look at the suburb, but look at the surrounding suburbs and what are the catchment areas and so on. Yeah. Um, so for me, a rule of thumb is I like to see at least 1500 um, patients per dentist as a rule mm -hmm. of thumb. Now, can it be done on less? Yes, it can. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can. But 1500 for me is a sweet spot. 2000 is even nicer. But 1500 is, is a rule of thumb. Um, and again, um, yeah, it's subject to lots of different um, other criteria as well. Okay, that's great. Um, so thank you so much for that. I think, um, you know, coming from, you know, the, the target audience that we have with uh, younger dentists, a lot of us are, you know, just finishing up dental school, a lot of us have been out for a couple of years and we got that little itch to kind of uh, jump into practice ownership. Um, so yeah. So it's nice to kind of, uh, I mean, not, my, my podcast is not really like a business podcast, it's more of a just clinical and kind of uh, things, but um, it's nice to have this kind of uh, change of pace a little bit and have you on today to talk a little bit of business as well. Cause I think going forward, it is going to be an important aspect of dentistry, regardless if you're going to be an associate or a practice owner, um, you've got to understand these kind of things if you want to kind of succeed in the workforce kind of going forward. Um, so what I'd like to do just to kind of uh, line things up is uh, just, I normally end off with a bit of a rapid fire. So it's got a few questions lined up here for you, if you don't mind, and uh, we'll jump into them. Okay. So what is uh, your favorite pizza topping? My favorite pizza topping of all time is yeah. anything that has pepperoni. Pepperoni. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what is your favorite band or artist? Ah, okay. So this is a really great question. I'm known at my events for playing ACDC. So yeah. I love ACDC, but my favorite, favorite band of all time, really, that doesn't get much publicity is the Beatles. <laughs> I haven't heard of them. No, I'm just kidding. You haven't heard of the Beatles? No, I'm just kidding. What's your, uh, what's your favorite Beatles album? My favorite Beatles album is Abbey Road. Abbey Road. Yeah, I'm a big uh, Sgt. Pepper's. Uh, that's a good album for me. A lot, a lot of good tunes on that. It's just like a back to back to back hits really on that one. Other purpose is awesome. Yeah. Um, so if not dentistry, and obviously, I mean, you've uh, branched out already a little bit, um, but if not dentistry, what field of work would you be in? Law. Law? Okay. Law. Yeah. And what is the uh, most impactful uh, book you've read in your life? Oh, okay. There's, you can probably see behind me, I've got a bookcase. Um, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a ton of them there, but I think probably the book, there are a few books that I can say genuinely changed my life. 
Um, but at the time, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was a book that genuinely changed my life. It was fantastic. Such a great, yeah, amazing book for sure. Yeah. Can I add a second one? Yeah, for sure. The second book I, I really loved was by a lady called Brene Brown and it's called Daring Greatly. And she's got a terrific TED talk on connection. Okay, Daring Greatly. I'll write that one down. Okay. And so the last one here in the rapid fire is what is your uh, favorite sports team or athlete? I know you kind of touched on this maybe a little bit already, but no, that's okay. My favorite sports of all time is cricket. Yeah. Um, and my favorite athlete is Steve Waugh because he's so incredibly tough. He had the ability to take a beating and just yeah. keep taking a beating and ultimately <laughs> succeed. Keep going. That's great. Jesse, thank you so much uh, for coming on the podcast. It's been, uh, it's been great to kind of have, uh, you know, an hour of your time and kind of pick your brain a little bit on some of these topics that I think a lot of people will get a lot of value from. If you don't mind, uh, where can kind of our listeners reach out to you if they have any follow-up questions or want to get in touch with you in the future? Sure. If uh, people have questions, they can head across to our Facebook group. If they'd like to join us there, it's the Savvy Dentist Facebook group. And it's uh, drjessegreen.com forward slash Facebook. Um, or they can just email us at hello at drjessegreen.com and we'd be happy to answer any questions that people have there. But um, just quickly, I want to say thank you to you. I mean, you've got a tremendous show. You're doing wonderful work. I think thank you. great service to the profession and to your generation of dentists. So uh, keep going, my friend. It's terrific. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's great. Um, and I'll put the, uh, obviously I'll put a link for your uh, podcast as well in the show notes. If uh, some of the American listeners maybe may have not heard of it, um, but it's cool to uh, talk to a fellow Australian podcaster. So it's been great. Uh, thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you. Perfect.